Second special guest appearance of the week, guys. Cup Series Rookie of the Year contender Daniel Hemrick joins the show today. How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric, and welcome to Out of the Groove. Earlier this week, I was very fortunate to get to video chat with Daniel Hemrick, a driver of the number eight Chevrolet for Richard Childress Racing. We talked a little bit about his season so far, uh, how he got started into racing, and the struggles he went through to get to where he is today. We talked about all that and more, so I hope you find it interesting. Uh, but yeah, without further ado, here's my interview from earlier this week with driver Daniel Hemrick. All right, so how's it going, everyone? Uh, welcome to Out of the Groove. I am super honored to be joined today by uh, NASCAR Monster Energy Cup Series driver, driver the number eight for RCR, Daniel Hemrick. How's it going today, man? I'm doing good, man. Hope you are, and hope everybody watching and listening are doing well. Yeah, for sure, man. Uh, so just to start off, tell me a little bit about you guys' season so far. Driving for RCR, first full year in the Cup Series. What's that been like, man? Yeah, it's been an incredible experience. You know, Richard Childress Racing is in its 50th year this year, and that's uh, it's pretty wild. My boss, Richard Childress, says I never thought I'd make it to 50 years old, let alone have a race team for 50 years. So it really shows uh, the dedication and commitment from an entire group and organization of, of men and women at our, at our organization that believe in the common goal of working up and striving every day to be better than you were the day before. And I get to kind of, I guess you could say, live on the labors of others way before me. And that's uh, it's really cool and really special. But to get to the cup level and be able to do the things that we're doing, you know, one of 40 people in the world get a chance to sit where I'm sitting currently. So it's very special and I'm trying to make the most of it every weekend. Definitely, man. Uh, I, I like doing my show. I like to, you know, a lot of new faces in NASCAR. I think it's important for people to be able to relate to the new drivers. So I like to know a lot about kind of where, how they got started, where they got started. And I read a really interesting piece about you. I think it was from the Charlotte Observer recently where you did, did an interview. And it was talking about the, some of the struggles you had to go through just to get to the racetrack every weekend early on when you're trying to break into the big scene. Uh, what can you tell us about, like, how you got your start in racing? And, and when did you make the decision that you w knew you wanted to be a race car driver? <laughs> We would need a, a show that lasts for days to, to tell a lot of it, but sure. yeah, it's just been a, a very humbling and um, a journey that I'm proud of to kind of withstand the storm and be standing where I'm at today. Yeah, you know, my stepfather raced, you know, up north growing up, and uh, my dad's side of the family and mom's side of the family were always just family. I mean, the, that side were always just uh, fans of the sport. Um, being here from the no local North Carolina area is a deal to where you could go asphalt racing and go to a lot of different racetracks in a very short window, you know, without having to go too far. And, and because of that, at five years old, jumped in a go-kart and immediately felt that, that sense of competition and the things that drive people to pursue anything in life because, you know, they feel like they're good at it. And, and fortunately, along the way, you know, I, I had a lot of people give me opportunities and breaks. Whenever I was at my breaking point, that would have really taken me out of the sport altogether. And because of those moments, it's, it's made you appreciate them and, and made me uh, very thankful that I'm able to get to where I'm at. You know, I, talking about that piece I did with Charlotte Observer, it, it, was, a, it was cool to sit down and do that because gave some people, you know, kind of the backstory on, on how, you know, my family were just average blue-collar folks. Um, they were, you know, service, service riders at a local dealership. You pull your car in and get an oil change. They were the ones hanging a tag in your window. And it's like, how does, how does you know, this don't make sense. How does this kid get to the cup level? without having any family backing. And uh, I think it just comes around, comes back to surrounding yourself with good people. And um, with good people, you can do a lot of great things in life. And uh, I've had a lot of those around me. And um, I talked about the ones that give me breaks and um, and the ones that may have not thought they were huge breaks, they were still involved around whether they had a race car and said, hey, here's a, car, here's a car, if you can build it, put it together and figure out how to get to the racetrack, it's up to you to make it happen. And in those moments, you, you learn a lot about yourself and the tenacity you have to keep going when the going gets tough. And, and because of that, I think that's led me um, to where I'm at today and very thankful for all those along the way. Yeah, definitely, man. I know you're also, uh, uh, after that le big Legends car win you had in 2010, one of your first big like on-the-scene victories, I know you did a backflip after that. I read somewhere that it was inspired by Carl Edwards. Is that true? And, and will we ever see the backflip again in modern day? I can promise you, if I can win at this level, um, you'll see a backflip. And yeah, talking about that Legends Million race, you know, that was my first opportunity you know, to really perform on a live national television stage. And there was 330 uh, competitors, you know, signed up for that race, and for us to come out on top that night and be able to do a backflip, uh, which is something that you know that race was at my hometown racetrack, so something that a lot of the local fans there had seen, but you know, the national scene had never seen anybody outside of Carl Edwards do it. And 
you know, for me, watching Carl do it as a kid for the first time in the truck series, that's the first time I'd heard of Carl Edwards and thought, man, that, that's a pretty cool deal there. Let me see if I can pull that off. And I won a local race shortly after that that um, allowed me to do it for the first time. So it was cool to do it, you know, that many years later um, at Charlotte Motor Speedway for the Legends Million and be able to continue to do that later into my career through all other forms of, of cars I was fortunate to win in and um, looking forward to that first opportunity to do it at this level. Yeah, for sure. Um, what does it mean for you to not only be, you know, you're a rookie in the Cup Series now, but you're also driving the number eight for Richard Childress. Obviously, the Earnhardt legacy uh, has meant a ton to, for the sport. I know you grew up in the same hometown that the Earnhardts are uh, from. Uh, what is that legacy kind of continuing now? What does that mean for you? It means everything to me. You know, growing up in the Kannapolis, North Carolina area, you know, there's two names that were at the top and they were the pinnacle of our sport. And those are the icons of Dale Earnhardt and Richard Childress. Um, you know, as a kid dreaming at five years old of, of getting to this level, you know, you can dream about it, but is it actually obtainable? Um, probably not. And, you know, lo and behold, here we are. And, you know, talking about the number eight in itself, you know, the, the history that came, you know, before, you know, before Dale Jr., but with, with his grandfather, Ralph, and, and, uh, and even Dale running the number eight, and, and what that number's meant to her, you know, even way before those folks, it, it's been incredible to know that I get to add my own part of, of history to that number and to that legacy. And, been even more special to me to see the fans rally behind us, bringing the eight number back, have the eight car on the racetrack again. It's been really cool to see the hype around it. Uh, this is a kind of more of a question that I'm really interested in. I'm sure other people would be as well, but I was really excited to see that you're going to be running uh, the Slinger Nationals later this summer. Uh, mainly I'm excited because I'm going to be at that race, so I'm excited to see you <laughs> hopefully go for a win out there. But uh, uh, w w how'd that whole deal kind of come about? Yeah, I'm really pumped to go be a part of the Slinger Nationals for the first time. That's Something that was uh, you know, a race that was on my bucket list. It's a crown jewel race for super late model racing. And, you know, super late model racing has been a huge part of getting me to where I'm at today. So to be able to finally go there and race for the first time, I'll be racing for uh, Chris and Jana Wimmer with Wimmer Motorsports. And those that don't know, you know, Chris Wimmer has done all of Harrison Burton, Jeff Burton's son's late model stuff for the last couple of years. And should be a, a really good opportunity. And anytime you're out in Wisconsin is some of the best race fans, uh, some of the best short track legends and racers in, in general have come from that area. So I'm looking forward to going there and going toe to toe and having a little fun short track racing as well. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Uh, now looking ahead this weekend to Pocono, the Tricky Triangle, uh, you have a new sponsor on the car this weekend. Tell me a little bit about them. Tell me a little bit about uh, your expectations going into Pocono. For the last couple of years, I've just been pumped about the sponsor of my shirt, Kalahari Resorts and Conventions, solely because I got to go and it, enjoy the time at the in America's largest indoor water park. And my wife and I always got to go have a good time there. And it's funny, I never would have thought it came full circle to where I got to represent them on a race car. But you know, Kalahari has been a partner of Richard Childress Racing for now four consecutive years, and that says something special. Um, you know, it's it's in a day and time where it's hard to come by partners and hard to come by partnerships to have someone step up for the fourth year is very special to me to be able to honor you know what the drivers before me that have represented Kalahari have done but look forward to making my own with it and we have an incredibly cool uh, water themed paint scheme this week and uh, I think the fans will really enjoy it and um, luckily the Kalahari Resort is so close to the racetrack if they're still looking for a place to stay they know where to go. That's awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you taking the time uh, out of your busy schedule to chat with us here on the show. Uh, yeah, good luck this weekend. Thanks for coming on, man. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me on. And yeah, that's really going to do it for the show. Kind of a one-off special kind of showcase interview, spotlight interview of sorts. Again, I want to say a big thank you to Daniel Hemrick for coming on the show, for talking with me, for giving you guys some insight into his career up to this point. The second Cup Series driver we've had on Out of the Groove just this year, and it's the second NASCAR driver we've had on the show this week. Uh, funny how things work out like that. I didn't plan on having two driver interviews this week, but... Goodness, I wasn't going to say no when it presented itself to me. I want to stop and take a moment to thank every single one of you who watch this show and support this show. Ever since I started Out of the Groove, goodness, almost three years ago, I really never thought it would get to the point today where I'm actually able to sit down and talk with active NASCAR Cup Series drivers and just chat with them about their careers. I never thought that was really going to happen. I hope you guys enjoy these because uh, the more support I get, the more views I get, the more the more engagement I get on these, the more you guys enjoy them, the more you guys support them, uh, the better the chance uh, there is that I'll get your favorite driver on the show sometime in the not so distant future. So uh, yeah, like I said earlier, I'm working on getting other drivers from all sorts of different NASCAR and you know racing related series uh, to come on the show in the near future. 
and hopefully some of that works out uh, because I think it's really fun to kind of you know, bridge the gap between the real NASCAR racing world and what we're doing over here on this online community. I think that's super awesome, and I really appreciate it uh, when guys like Harrison Burton earlier this week or Eric Almarola earlier in the year or Daniel Hemmerich, of course, today, uh, when they sit down and take the time to talk with all of us over here. Uh, that really means a lot to me, and I hope I can continue to bring all of you watching uh, great NASCAR content for the foreseeable future. Uh, but thank you all so much for the support. Thanks to all you guys uh, able to get to do these awesome things, and wouldn't be here without you. But yeah, that's my show. Uh, remember, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Out of the Groove t-shirts if you want to support the show, support me uh, even further. You can check those out down by the description. And then, of course, a uh, big thank you to the real MVPs, my Patreon supporters. Michael Harrison, at you is the star, SelfishGifts.com, Mentally Defective, Cameron James, John Coblenz, Jason R. Long, Wesley Donaldson, Isaac Dennison, Mika Suzuki, iFantasyRace.com, TheRacingInsiders.com, Adam Lean, Matthew Kulopoulos, and the rest of these awesome Patreon supporters. You guys go the extra mile and really help me out a ton, so uh, I greatly appreciate it. Thank you so, so very much. I do have a mail unboxing video coming up very, very soon, uh, probably early next week, so you're probably not going to see me again until after the Pocono race Sunday. Uh, so if I don't see you until then, hope you have a great start uh, to your weekend, and I will see you guys after Pocono. The Tricky Triangle should be an interesting one. This arrow package is going to maybe make Pocono a little different than we've seen in recent years. Not sure exactly. I don't know that it's going to make anything too crazy. It's not going to turn Pocono into you know, a Bristol race or anything, but it might be interesting. So uh, I'll see you guys after that one. Hope you have a great rest of your Friday. I'll see you guys very, very soon.